This is Recap Sunday. Recap. We're going to go back over the things that we've talked about for the last few weeks. And uh, as most of you, if not all of you, are well aware, we have been talking about prayer. Prayer as the foundational element of a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And we, of course, are people that is transforming towards that. And we've been talking about prayer in Matthew chapter 26 along verse 40. Jesus said this to three of his closest disciples at that time. He said, could you not even watch with me for one hour? This was right after Jesus had prayed and asked, Father, if it be any way that this cup would pass from me, I pray that you would let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he went back, and there was Peter, James, and John, fast asleep again. Could you not pray with me one hour? And we said for the last month and a half or so that, that this prayer, this opportunity that God gives us is what gives us access and the opportunity to build this genuine relationship with Him. So we're going to go back through the weeks, and, and uh, we have some, some highlights, some high points. And uh, I have uh, presented a a pass out, uh, a little brochure, a flyer to pass out to you guys. I don't know if those are completely ready just yet. Um, well, as soon as we get those ready, we'll get them in your hands. Week one, we define prayer. We said, you know, prayer, simply put, is a conversation with God. It's just talking with God. And, and, and we're all aware, well aware of what a conversation looks like. A conversation is when two different people get together and they talk back and forth. It's a talking conversation and a listening. During that, that week, we said this is the basis of the basics of a relationship. And we looked at four different things that helped us to define prayer. These four different areas of prayer or four different types of prayer. We said, you know, there's thankfulness. And this is where we see that our heart is changed as we, uh, as we set out and intentionally express our gratitude or our thankfulness for the Lord. We said that it's a time of praise. Not only is thankfulness a type of prayer, but praising God is a motivation towards victory. The third thing we said was prayer is confession. It is a time to admit or to agree with God. I, I think of that kind of like whenever maybe you've seen these court cases uh, where the evidence is overwhelming. And once the evidence is brought forth, then the person has really no logical other way to do it than to just say, you know what, I plead guilty. Prayer, communication, talking to God is a time where we can confess. Week one, as you'll see on your hand out there, there's four different areas there that we're looking at. We've talked about thankfulness, praise, confession, and the fourth one is prayer, a conversation with, us, with God is a time for us to petition. This is a time, much like you hear a baby crying out, trying to express what is needed, okay? So that's a lot of what petitioning is. It's just simply stating what we need. Week two, we looked at the example of Jesus. And in that week, we emphasized the genuine relationship. This is what we said. We're going to focus on this, that prayer is not just something that we do for ourselves, but it is something that is a very foundational element of building a, a genuine relationship. And uh, as we looked at that, there was four insights on the Scriptures of how uh, a genuine relationship can be brought forth. The first thing we said as we looked at the example of Jesus, we said, you know what? Jesus prayed often. Very often Jesus prayed. That's in Luke 5 and 16. And in six, chapter 6, verse 12, we see that very often Jesus prayed for extended periods of time. Jesus prayed extended prayers. That scripture says that he, he prayed all night long. In Luke chapter 22, we see that Jesus prayed transparently. Uh, and we talked about how to try to better understand this would be something similar to whenever you have a guest in your home and you let them tour your entire house. Even that one closet in the very back of your boy's room, maybe, or uh, where they have stuffed everything to clean up their room. It just simply means I'm opening up all that I am for your observation. And that's the way Jesus prayed. 
You can read through these scriptures and see that that's just exactly what it looked like in Luke chapter 22. And in John 17, we see that Jesus prayed humble prayers. Humbly, he sought the Lord. This is critical in a genuine relationship for us to humble ourselves as we approach communication opportunities. I thought about this as kind of like uh, some of our better athletes. They're not always on the field or the court just to show the world what they're able to do, but to assist their team. And that's what brings about ultimate victory. It's being able to say, you know what, I could do this for myself or I might could try this myself. I'm going to do my best to assist someone else and work forward for a team movement. So that was week two. Week three, we said, you know, kind of like passing the baton in a relay race, it's our turn or it's your turn was it that's the title of that week's sermon and this is where we begin to take a little bit of a a little bit of a turn if you will the unique action piece of personally discovering this is where we say you know what I see I'm, I'm hearing I'm receiving but now it's time for me to make a decision am I willing to do this am I willing to put forth the effort to pray or Am I just going to keep on snoozing? All right, and we're going to keep pointing to this scripture in, uh, in Matthew chapter 26 as the, as the time goes on. But that's what we're looking at in week three. The passing of the baton, the unique action of personally discovering. And I said, you know what? There's four different actions that are involved that we, we can use to kind of consider this. Four different things to be done. Number one, ditch the perfection. Now, if you're anything like me, this is a big deal. I'm the guy that likes to make sure everything is going to be perfect before I even begin. And this is what I'm learning about that. If you want to never do anything, if you want to just live life paralyzed, then that's a great motto to follow. But if you want to move forward, then you need to realize that failure is very often the first step. So if you'll go ahead and embrace that in the very beginning, say, you know what, this is going to be something new. This is going to be something that I'm not accustomed to doing, so I've got to get over this whole idea that it has to be perfect, and it has to happen perfect every time. So that's what we said, ditch the perfection. That's out of Luke chapter 22, verse 32, and that is in reference to Jesus mentoring and leading the apostle uh, or the disciple Peter at that time. The second thing is, is we need to stop comparing ourselves. I appreciate Pastor Paul last week when he said, you know what, if I just compare myself to everyone else, I can make myself look pretty good. But when I start comparing myself to Jesus, now that's a whole different story. But a lot of us get really bogged down in comparing ourselves. And, and, and wouldn't you realize with me that the way that this world is set up with the technology, with the social networking and everything of how so many thousands of people can stay connected 24-7, that that can something that would be something that would be very easy to do to compare yourself to others if we're going to move forward in personally discovering prayer then we got to stop comparing what we're doing and what we're able to do to what everybody else is doing I don't know about you but me personally it sh it shuts me down physically when I sense that someone else is comparing what they're doing to what I'm doing it makes me want to just step out of the whole thing uh, I never saw this in Jesus' leadership. He never presented himself as very condescending and judgmental to those that were working to move forward. So we need to give ourselves a break as well as others. Thirdly, it is a time to plan and prepare. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught us how to pray. Acts chapter 4, we see him instructing the early uh, apostles on, on what to do and how to approach prayer and, and tapping into that power. There comes a time when you have to plan and prepare. I read, a, I read a blog the other day that said this about our Sabbath, the day that, the day that we consecrate and we set aside for the Lord. And, and a lot of us would agree that today is that day. This is the day that God is the priority of everything. And one thing that I appreciated that it pointed out was that it actually begins the night before. I have to plan and I have to prepare for a lot of times, I think this is why it's crucial for us to send out those little texts, those little reminders that, hey, this is what's going on tomorrow. This is what you need to plan for and prepare for now. This day for, for most all of us is a little bit different than, than any other days. And just like that, must we approach 
personally discovering prayer. The majority of people in, in, in Christianity today do not spend 15 minutes of, of time in prayer daily. The majority don't spend five. So if we're going to talk about Jesus leading us to a place where we can, we can worship and pray and praise and, 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 and offer up times of thankfulness and petitions and intercessions and, and, and just waiting upon him, if we could do with him what he asked the disciples to do, to watch and pray for one hour, then we have to know and, and, and see right now that that's going to take some planning, that's going to take some preparing. All right, and lastly, on week three for the unique action, we said uh, we need to give ourselves permission to fail. This kind of ties right back into the first point of ditch the perfection. You get over the initial desire to have everything right in the beginning, but then as you begin, there's going to be days when it just doesn't happen. There's going to be times whenever you, you're there and you feel like it just, you, just in, you, know, you just aren't in communication with God. Learn from it. Give yourself permission to fail. And uh, the scripture there is coming out of John chapter 17. That is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1 John 2, 1 and 2, about our approach to sin. And in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul says, uh, you know what, I don't say that I've attained perfection, yet I strive daily. Week 4. Week 4, we looked at the heart of the person. We said this is kind of like, uh, this is kind of like the status you might see on some of you that would uh, click on Facebook every now and then. It says, how you feeling? What's your status? We said, much like that, we're going to kind of check the pulse, if you will, of our heart. If we're people that are really transforming towards someone that is that's really moving forward in their prayer life and developing this genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the lifeline, is what connects us to the power, then how's our heart? And what's going on in our heart? He said it's like a status to check how we're feeling. And, and as we study the Scripture, we can see at least four observations. Number one, the very basis of a prayer is whenever you say, I want. This is the I want prayer. This is kind of like we were talking earlier in the weeks before this about the cry of a baby. It's simply about what I want you to do for me. We anticipate this, and we expect this, and we even long for this in the, in the lives of our young children. We, they are healthy when they can express to us their, what, what needs they have. But there's something quite different that takes place when you're in Walmart and you're in the toy aisle and that kid is throwing a temper tantrum. What are they doing? They're telling you, this is what I want. But you as a parent know what they need, and there's a large gap between what they think they want, what they think they need, and the reality of where they are. So we look back in Genesis where the Israelites began to cry out to God for, for deliverance. And for some of us, this is the, the first prayers that God ever hears from us. God, this is what I want you to do. This is what I need. And we said, well, as we move from there, then it's a more healthy awareness. We get to the I need you, prayer. It's not just now about my wants. Now it's about the, the, the reality that, God, I really do need you. I need you, and we, we looked at Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 through 14, to study on that. And I don't think all of you got to see this, but there's a video that's uh, floating around on YouTube by a rabbi, and the, the title of the video is Fish Love. And uh, just to kind of condense it down, this is basically what the guy says, uh, helping us to understand what love is. He says, so you say you love fish. So you, you, you pull the fish out of the water, you boil it, and you eat it. And yet you say you love the fish. That's not love. You love yourself. You use the fish as an avenue of instant and self-gratification. And, and sadly, but very indicative of where a lot of our society is, is this is what love means to most people. I really, when I say I love you, I really am excited about what you can do for me. I love fish, so I'll kill it and eat it. And when I say, some people would say I love you, what that really means is I would, I'm looking forward to using you to meet my needs. Fish love. 
So we began looking at our heart and said, well, if, all, if it's always about our wants, and if it's only always about our needs in prayer, then are we not similar, similarly approaching God like kind of the same way? Like this is a one, one-sided relationship. God, I'm asking you to do this and do this and do this and to meet my needs here. I need this from you, and I realize that you have it. Now give it to me. We said this is where the heart has to make a change. We have to move purposefully. And, and, and this is where we evaluated the status of our heart. And the third thing is the prayer of I surrender. I surrender. It's not about me any longer. It's not, Jesus, Jesus says, it's not my will, but it's yours. And, and that leads directly into number four, which is the I love you too prayer. And as I, I, I distinctly remember praying and asking God to help me understand more about this, this heart change that must take place. And, and whenever he gave me a glimpse of this, it just made sense to me, and maybe it will to you too. This is the difference uh, whenever a young man would approach a young lady for a proposal and looking forward to the honeymoon and say, I love you. That level of love and, and how different it might look when you are a father of a young girl, a young lady, and the level of love that you're asking for a young man to give to her. Do you, do you think it might be different sometimes? Do you think the, the I love you on the honeymoon might be different from the I love you whenever, the, whenever a guy's asking for the hand of your daughter? Now, I guarantee you for most of us it is. I want you to love my daughter maybe in a little deeper way than you have ever known love. This is the difference that takes place in the heart. And then we invited... Pastor Paul up this past week in week number five. What does the life of this person look like? I pulled some of my takeaways from it. And uh, very quickly, Pastor Paul said in Psalms 4610, uh, the scripture says, Be still and know that I am God. And being still and waiting and listening to the Lord requires that I struggle with myself. That lets us know right there that it's not going to be easy. This is not something that if we're waiting on it to come natural, if you're going to lay on your rear all morning and say, well, I'm going to pray when I feel like it, then know this, you probably will never develop the prayer life. You're going to have to struggle with yourself, and particularly in this area of being still. Being still. I must be willing to sign over the deed of my life. That's where, where Pastor Paul landed, and we had little pieces of paper up here on the platform where you could come and get them to, to serve as a reminder of what it really has to look like in the life of a believer that is really committed to developing this genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about me no more. It's not about what, what this offers to me, what it brings to me. This is simply a move on my behalf of surrendering all that I am to all that you are. And that pretty well brings us up to date on our series on prayer. And let me tell you what I am learning through preaching through uh, and studying through about two months of prayer. I feel like I'm just getting to the tip of the iceberg. Seriously. This past Wednesday night, for the last three weeks, we've been studying prayer in the adult Bible class. No, I take that back. We were studying, we were studying the 10-day word fast, and then we moved to prayer this past Wednesday night. And then we got these books. We got 25 of these books, and we asked people to... Uh, to get these books and read the first five chapters. This is the, this is the book for the hour that changes the world. To give us a, a, maybe a, an opportunity to learn more and to dive deeper. Because really, we, we really haven't really done nothing but just really scratch the surface or raise the awareness of, the, uh, of how vital 
prayer is. My wife and I were having a conversation the other day, and, and she referenced the scripture in the story of Daniel and how Daniel was, was praying. And for days and days and days, the Lord the, had sent an angel, but for days after days, the angel was unable to get to him because why? There were evil forces that were forbidding him from getting there. And then God sent the angel, the archangel Michael, to hold the evilness at bay. And Audrey said, I guess it just, it's just amazing to think about what's going on. And I sat down this morning beside Brother Bill, and, 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 and he began talking about what we talked about Wednesday night, how, how difficult it is to really stay focused and to not be distracted. And this point was brought out that, you know, whenever our life is wrecked, whenever things are just going the way that we know they shouldn't be going, those times it seems to be a little easier to stay focused. But it's on those days when things really aren't that bad. You know, the bills are paid. Everybody's somewhat healthy. You know, job's okay. Those are the days whenever, you know, uh, like a while ago during worship, that one graphic that was put up there behind one of those songs, because it was running water, I have to start thinking about trout. Right in the middle of worship. I'm thinking, dude, that, that water's so clear, I think I could see a fish in there. <laughs> then I went to bow fishing. I'm just being real with you. And sometimes it's like that in my prayer life. I'm like, God, I want to I pray right now, and I want to spend some time with you. And Man, when them trees start budding out, I know the catfish are going to be biting. And then for, for 10 minutes, I done put trot lines, drop lines, I done clean fish, I done invite them out. And then I'm thinking, what am I even doing? I'm, supposed, I'm, I'm down here supposed to be praying. But let one of them kids get 104 fever. I don't have no problem focusing then. So what does that help me to see? Maybe if, if things, whenever they are that real and that urgent, I, I focus, maybe the times that I'm not focusing, maybe that's whenever I don't really sense how urgent things really are. Maybe the times when I kneel before my Father and find it challenging to stay, you know, to stay focused on prayer, maybe that's whenever I have somewhat lost sight of just really what's going on. And the Apostle Paul says, this isn't, this isn't a flesh and blood war. This is spiritual warfare we're in. Oh, yeah, we're, we're battling spiritual wickedness in high places. This evilness. In this, in this book, before he even gets into the first part of prayer, it says this, no matter our position in life or natural, ability, natural abilities, to be used by God, we must understand a fundamental principle of spiritual power. So I want to ask you just to consider with me for a few minutes before I read the rest of this. Consider with me maybe what's going on in your life today. Uh, are you offended? Is there something that's going on that, that really has you stirred up? Someone, something? Maybe, maybe you're a little anxious about something. Maybe there's some, some fear there of, of what's going on or, or your perception of what's going on or even maybe what you think might possibly happen. Maybe there's someone in, uh, not very far from you that you're just having a real hard time loving and you would admit that you don't like them. These are all things that are quite normal in our world today. When we start talking about spiritual power, we as believers in Christ realize that that alone is what it takes. It's God's grace in me. Outside of God's grace, I don't have anything within me that will help me to rise above just a few things I've just mentioned. I don't have it. I, I, the, the best I can do is to try to cover it up and make it worse. But to really properly deal with it, it's going to take spiritual power. What we do for the Lord is entirely dependent upon what we are in the Lord. Further, what we are in the Lord, it wholly depends on what we receive from the Lord. And then what we receive from the Lord is directly proportional to the time we spend alone with the Lord. 
And someone say, well, you're using a book up there. What about the Bible? Now, I believe that there's this it's an incredible assumption in the Scripture is that you will look at the life of Christ, look at the life of the disciples that become the apostles, look at it, the lives of all the great men and women of faith, and the assumption is this, you are going to pray. And because the Scripture mostly or generally doesn't just come right out and say, this is what you should do, this is what it should look like, there is an incredible understanding that just is a theme throughout all of Scripture that we, as followers of Christ, will personally discover prayer as a foundational element in His genuine relationship with Him. And this is my challenge for you as we wrap up this day. Whatever your problem is, whatever it is that you're working through, struggling with, then could I just submit to you that possibly, quite, quite possibly, the reason that that problem exists in your life is because of an absence of prayer. Does it mean we're not going to go through challenges? Sure, it doesn't. Matter of fact, Jesus promises those when they come. But if you read through James, you'll see that it is a total different approach to encounter trials and temptations with joy. How does that happen? It will only ever happen as we are people committed to prayer. I'll leave you with this. To the person that would say, I don't see how I could pray for an hour a day. I would say this. Maybe you're better than Jesus. He had to do it. I'm not sure who we are to think that we shouldn't either. If you'd be interested to learn more about this, then I would challenge you and invite you to commit to coming on Wednesday nights. For the next weeks, that's what we're going to be really working to study. Right here, 630. I'm here to tell you. I might not tell you this as boldly as I am right now, face to face, but your problem is you're not praying. That's your problem. You, I mean, we can, we can wrap it up any way we want, but whatever this issue is you're dealing with, whatever this struggle is you're having, it can be solved through prayer. It can be solved.